go. Brooks Lennon needs to make a play here. He doesn't. Oh, it's through to seal the deal. A no-look finish by Shallowy and Sporting Kansas City. Stack their ticket to the conference final. And there's Martinez. He's onside. Joseph Martinez! Royer trying to get himself back onside, as is Wright Phillips, he's offside now, Royer also has Muriel coming forward, Royer takes it himself and scores! Six plus six is twelve, minus eight, that's four, quick playoff maths for you, the Audi 2018 MLS Cup. Playoffs roll on. We are down to four teams. Did you get the reference, Doyle, or did you I not? I, I was told there would be no math. Yeah, actually. well, you know what? I think our audience at home did. What a day it has been. Three games. We're down to four teams. We know the conference championships, of course. Sporting Kansas City, Portland Timbers in the west, out east. Red Bulls, Atlanta United, the one and two seed, the Timbers right now. At the five seed Crash are the, the upset special. Ali Krieger, World Cup winner. We're happy to be joined by her. You know these guys. Bobby Warshaw will be here in a second. Before we get to the highlights, the analysis, the interviews, of which we have many, your feelings right now, this very second, after we watch the Red Bulls move on. It was so exciting, all three games, but most importantly, that game, and um, a bit unexpected because of how Columbus came out the first leg. So I guess I was expecting them to, you know, play somewhat similar um, in the second leg. But, you know, the Red Bulls came out from start to finish, uh, so clinical and um, just such a great team performance, great team win. And that was really exciting to see going into now the Eastern Conference Championship um, and I think they deserved it. Yeah. I mean, they high pressed and put Columbus under pressure. They couldn't build out of the back uh, like they did in the first leg. So that was that was great to see because I think they struggled in the first leg. Um, Red Bulls, you know, uh, against Columbus, doing that. Yeah, all those even keeled Red Bulls fans on Twitter that were saying, "Hold on, the sky is not falling. It's going to be okay. This is the best team in league history. They're going to come home and handle that business." Well, they did. Yeah. How do you feel, guys? Not just about the Red Bulls, but Kansas well, City. I know. I want to know how you feel about the fact that Alex Moyle had a goal and an assist, and do you have him now on your 22? I feel 22? it's criminal that a man that's over the age of 22 would miss out on that list, but I want everyone at home to know <laughs> that I was the number one proponent of taking that goal away from Aaron Long, who I love and respect and think is a great player, and giving it to the god. <laughs> Alex justice, Moore. yes. Yes, justice has been served. We, he's the bringer of justice. Exactly. I, I was watching these matches. And I, I watched the Atlanta performance. And I was like, oh, th this team now is the favorite for MLS Cup. I, I was like, this is definitely going to happen. And then I watched the Red Bulls play, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this Red Bulls team looked for real. And, and look, they had not been able to get over this psychological hurdle for a while. They hadn't been lost a first leg and then come back and won the second. Mm -hmm. So once they were able to get over that hump, now there's a sense of belief in the team. And when that sort of uh, wave of pressure keeps coming, they were able to get two and three minutes. And, and now they have all the things. So I, I think actually Red Bull, I know we'll get to that a little bit later, but I, I can't wait for this Red yeah. Bull Atlanta United Conference series. preview's coming up. Your quick thought, and we'll hit the highlights. Yeah, the, the best teams won today. The, the three teams that I think we felt were the best going into these playoffs, they all made it through into the conference uh, championships. And like you said, Kalen, this is, uh, I mean, Atlanta, Red Bull, both clicking. Like, this should be awesome. And, and give props to the teams that, uh, that have been able to, you know, make it so tough. But uh, when you look at this league over the past several years, you're starting to notice a little bit of a trend. We thought Toronto FC was going to make it to the final last year, the year before Seattle. Now you're seeing, again, the one and two seeds advancing. Uh, I think that's a positive as well. You get the best teams who deserve it playing at the end of the season. Want to do some yeah. highlights? Uh, we do. Yeah. The people at home, they deserve to see these highlights. And we start with Kansas City. Straight up the gut. And straight up the gut. And a nice goal right here. A little bit of team play. And uh, they were just caught in RSL up right up the middle. But it was weird to see Kansas City forget how to defend about halfway through this game. Again, that's just a beautiful run from Daniel Shallow and a, and a great ball. But, RSL refused to die. Like they ended up turning it into like a ragged stretch, street ball kind of game, uh, and they you know pulled themselves back into it. And at this point, you know they were only one goal away, and it didn't feel like it was coming. And then that, and I guess like little. A little this. bit of fun. Oh, don't from watch this. No, look, he's not uh, looking. He didn't look. Uh, he never right. his jack. <laughs> We're moving on. And of course, Atlanta moving on too. They are honoring Tata because they didn't know Kaylin this could be his last game 
in MLS, but it was not to be for New York City FC. Yeah, it was a, it was a great little ball there from Nagby to, to set him free on the side and then and maybe a little bit of a rash challenge. Unconventional penalty kick, but this is how, uh, there's no stopping this. Unconventional I mean, wall, man. Miguel that wall is not set up right. Well, I, I don't think there's any stopping that. They maybe <laughs> nudged it up a couple of yards ahead of time, but Atlanta United, so impressive. And Ali, this is the game that we just got done watching, and this was a performance by the Red Bulls when they had to have it. They absolutely had to have this. Absolutely. It was such an incredible game. Like I said before, from start to finish, they defended well, they attacked well, they put pressure on Columbus, which made it difficult for them to build out of the back. Um, they created uh, goals from a, a great team uh, build-up. This is Barca-esque, I feel. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And um, obviously from Royer, he had those two great goals, which obviously sealed the deal for them in the end. Yeah, Danny Royer, a guy that in the middle of the year, he was the player of the month. He was almost unstoppable. I think Zach Steffen gets unsighted on this one. Yep. Because it, it's pretty close to him. And you can see it from this back angle. This is one you'd expect him to say, but I don't think he sees that till late. Danny Royer said after the game, he doesn't even know how it happened. <laughs> Talking to Katie Witham on FS1, he's like, I don't know, man. They just went in the net. I need to see the replays. Here are the scores for you on aggregate tonight. 4-2 Sporting Kansas City over Elsa Lake. A nail biter for the Blue Hell. 5-3 on aggregate. And in the East, Atlanta move on. Red Bulls move on. We've got the one and two seed, the two clubs that were going at it. This is our poll. Four teams are left. Quick mass, as I said. Who's going to win this thing, Kalen? <laughs> Who'd you have in your bracket? Does this match? Well, I have Seattle Sounders winning it all, so I I'm a little bit uh, yeah, hurt too. about me that too. still. <laughs> but I look, I, I can't say it enough. I want this Red Bull Atlanta game tomorrow. <laughs> I'm ready for this series. And I, I don't know who to pick. Maybe by the end of the, the, end of the show, someone will become clear. But Anybody got a gut me. reaction to this? Make a vote right now. I mean, I still have Red Bulls in, in Portland uh, alive in my bracket, so that's what I'm rooting for. But it does feel a little bit like 2014 when that great Sounders team played that great uh, Galaxy team in the Western Conference semifinals, and everyone was like, this is actually MLS Cup. Like, these are unquestionably the two best teams in the league. They have been all year. I'm with Kalen, man. I'm ready for this game tomorrow. What about the Western Conference? Give somebody I mean, some hope, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Kansas City had, had a solid performance today, and and I don't know. I'm thinking Kansas City, Atlanta. Yeah. That's that's my guess. All right, you got a little bit of hesitation in your voice. I think that's because of what we saw <laughs> yes, today. Yes, from Red Bull. Against they're Salt just, Lake. And again, the East. Yeah, they're very, very good. Uh, all right. Here we go. This is the schedule. This is what we're waiting for. And dang it, we got to wait two weeks. Oh, man. The international break slowing us down, unfortunately. But these are so juicy. I cannot wait. News is going to be rolling out out of every single market. Atlanta, New York Red Bulls. It, of course, starts at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. They set a record tonight, 70,000-plus in the playoffs. And then the nightcap, Portland Sporting Kansas City. Put these in your calendar. Make sure you don't schedule over them. Portland Sporting Kansas City. Here's the bracket, and here's how it stands. Yep. It's down to four. Sporting KC, Timbers. Red Bulls, Atlanta. Eight teams by the wayside. Their seasons are over. They're doing their exit interviews. They're trying to figure out where they're going Next year, the Red Bulls know where they're going. That's the conference championship for the fourth time in their history. Chris Armas led them there. We caught up with him after the game. Well, Chris, congratulations on winning tonight and winning this series. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, just from your vantage point tonight, with the 3-0 win, what was sort of the turning point that you saw, all right, we're going to take this one? You can see from the beginning of the game, there's, there's jitters, there's nerves, but... In our building, there's something special always, you know, and, and right away, I mean, the guys were talking about how much can we just look like us, and right away you could see. When you saw Daniel Royer not only just score the first goal, but then notch the brace, we've seen him do that this year, but what is it about him that really shone tonight? His play is always inspire, inspiring. It's infectious with the group, um, and listen, he came into the game with, I think, 11 goals. He's another, that one-two punch with him and Brad, He's comfortable around the goal. He can take penalties. So it doesn't surprise me because he, he loves scoring. I'm so happy for him. When in the first leg, Columbus seemed to sort of figure out your press. What, from a strategic standpoint, did you do to, to figure that out here? Well, I mean, from, from a pressing standpoint, we talked a little bit about going and coming and, and, and how to do each. On the night, we, we had Tyler Adams higher up the field. And to get around Artur and Will Trapp, instead of playing two sixes deep, we push, push one higher and not necessarily a 4-1-4-1 all the time, but 
we just tried to clog up that space, but they're very good. In just a larger sense, being able to be here with these fans tonight, you've won the Supporter Shield before, but we know it's the elusive MLS Cup that is what you're going for now. What does tonight's game mean in a broader perspective? Well, look, for the guys, you know, you, 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 from ex every experience you grow, and Columbus always gives us trouble. They do. And is that in our minds? Is it... So it's a big moment for our guys to take that step and to do what they did at home is incredible against a really good team. So you got Atlanta now. You, you've beaten them before, you've beaten them there. What are your thoughts right now? My thoughts are on, on this game and enjoying this with the guys. Um, we'll have our hands full again. Atlanta in every way, at home, well coached, tremendous talent on that team. They'll give us everything, but, but we'll go after them for sure. We're coming. Great. Well, congratulations tonight, Chris. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Congrats. We're coming, says Chris Armas, with a twinkle in his eye. Well, this is how they got there. It was 1-0 Columbus after that game at Matt Free Stadium, and, well, uh, some people thought the sky was falling. Well, Weeby, I, when we, I was looking back at this last uh, first leg. It was actually set pieces where the Red Bulls yep. caused – Columbus crew the most trouble so the press maybe uh, didn't quite work to begin with but they got off the, on the right track and, and got a little bit of an emotional lift from that early and game. this is a Chris Armas goal right here this is what he, he talked about when he came in at midseason wanting to be a little more precise with the ball wanting to be able to break teams down by passing rather than just winning 50 50s I doubted him I doubted their ability to do it that's one of the prettiest goals you will ever see in the playoffs a wonderful team goal uh, and it deserved a series winner, really. But Tyler Adams starts at left back there and yeah. ends up <laughs> squaring it across. They stifled this attack, too, for Columbus Alley. How did they do that? I mean, you know, just like Armas mentioned, how can we look like us in this game? And I think they focused on themselves both individually and collectively as a team, and they just got the job done. Um, and you could tell here, and they just, from start to finish, they were excellent. And it's now going to be a tough team to beat in the next couple games. Danny Royer's got to work on his backflip form there. <laughs> he did not quite complete that one. Alex Mueller on the back end trying to do it too. Julie Stewart Binks caught up with uh, Danny Royer after this game. Two goals. Let's hear what he had to say. Daniel, congratulations. Not only you get the win, but of course the brace tonight when it looked like things might be going for a long night. What changed in the second half? I don't know. I think we've just been a little more aggressive in the attacking part of the field and maybe a little bit more decisive. But I also thought that our first half was okay. We just couldn't uh, create the big chances, I think. And yeah, second half we were still working really hard, tried to press them a lot. And so I think that was the reason that maybe they got a little tired and so we could create some more chances. Knowing that Columbus had dealt so well with their press in that first leg, what did you guys do to approach the second leg? Yeah, they're tactical in it. To be honest, that's a really good team. I like the way they play. But, uh, you know, when we're at our best, it's really tough to play against us, especially in, with our pressing tactics. And I think, um, especially today, we did a really good job in terms of pressing, in terms of being aggressive, like uh, don't let the, the opponent breathe. They had to kick uh, many balls. I think they didn't like that. And that's just us. And, uh, yeah, that's why we came through today. Now, you had a good cartwheel, but your teammate Alex Muel didn't fare so well. Did you see him trying to do a cartwheel on your, on your goal there? He told me. He told me like five minutes ago, and I just saw it on the replay a little bit. But, yeah, he's a funny dude, a uh, hard worker. And um, I got I to gotta watch that again, but uh, it looks funny. All right, so you got Atlanta now, a team that you guys beat to get the supporter shield. What are your initial thoughts on a matchup with such a strong powerhouse? Yeah, that will be tough. They're, they're an amazing team. And uh, we had two wins against them this season. But, um, yeah, that... That gives us confidence, but it's two more new games against them. And we'll we'll be ready, but it will be will be really tough. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe save those backflips. <laughs> Is this a cartwheel that looks like an attempted backhand spring <laughs> oh, to me? Yeah, yeah. 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 lands on the hands. In the background, man. Yeah, I've got it done, just like in this series. And that was the expectation here, Allie. This is the best team in the regular season, 71 points. It's just that the postseason had been a uh, had been a graveyard of broken dreams, let's say, for the uh, the Red Bulls here. Absolutely. What is that pressure like when you're the best team and they expect you to win? Well, I mean, you know, some teams 
and uh, players do really well under pressure. And I, I guess tonight you could see that Red Bulls rolled up their sleeves and um, got the job done. And I think that's they just have to keep that same focus and same mentality going into the next game because their job isn't done. They haven't won. You know, you can you can celebrate and be happy with this, but now you're moving on to the biggest game. And so you got to take it one time, one game at a time, and one day at a time. But yeah, the pressure is tough. But oh. you know, the best teams uh, do well under pressure. Yeah. Ali, the, the person that stood out to me, and you can say, yeah, Daniel Royer had two goals, but to me, this is about Tyler Adams. Yep. This, this is his team now. And look, and you know, you, he's stepped up, and, and they moved on. Sasha Kleshin and Dax McCarty, two excellent players. But this is Tyler's team now, and he set the tone from the beginning of the match. We saw this last year, a little wrinkle that Jesse Marsh has done before against TFC in the second leg when they were behind. They pushed Tyler Adams a little bit more advanced to get on Michael Bradley, create some problems for TFC to be able to play. They did the same thing tonight, and his work rate was immense. I mean, this we talk so much about where's his best position with the national team, the number six role and behind it's it's compelling to put him there because he's so good on the tackle but he's best when he's further forward on the field and able to really cause problems in the press I'm not gonna go that far like he, he makes sense against a team like Columbus or against a team like TFC the TFC last year wanted to play everything through Bradley so you put Adams on him Columbus want to play everything th through trap and Artur so you push Adams up higher uh, he was he was excellent he was the best player on the field today for either team he deserves a ton of credit. Chris Harmus deserves a ton of credit for trusting him and putting him there. Also deserves a lot of credit for Sean Davis. Because if you switch from a 4-2-3-1, which they've played almost exclusively for the last three or four months, to what's really more of a 4-1-4-1, you're asking a lot of Sean Davis, especially because Pipa Iguain operates in that neighborhood. And he locked that down. With this goal again, though, he starts the ball. First yep. of all, he almost gets knocked off, and he shows his strength to be able to keep possession. He gets it again out wide. Look, he just plays and moves. But he starts to have a little bit of a sense here where he's just sensing, okay, the space is opening up. And then here, first of all, Muil, great stuff here, but the presence of mind here, just to have a nice little square ball across, it shows a little bit of composure in the box, which for a destroying center midfielder, it's a bit of quality that, you know, he doesn't always get credit for. Ali, go ahead, Bobby, sorry. Well, you, you know my favorite part about this Red Bulls performance is we have to talk about intensity. We talk about how can teams get up for the moment, and I always think when I think about this question, the Trinidad and Tobago game, right? The U.S. national team looks so flat, and we often just leave it to the players to raise their game to say, hey, can you get up for it? Why aren't you energetic? But you can do it tactically, and Chris Armas made his team more intense, made his team more energetic with this tactical change. He moved Tyler Adams, a runner, a guy who loves to chase the ball, who's really good at pressing, moving him farther up the field, allowing him more license to run, more license to press, lifted his whole team. I love when coaches take the onus and say, players, let me help you out. Our, our big charge today was, can we make Columbus feel uncomfortable? And Armas did that through his tactical adjustment. Players love that. Players love when coaches make a change that puts them in a position to succeed. Yeah, I hate when Bobby makes a good point. I know. <laughs> it's Tragedy. tough sometimes. It's tough sometimes. This is truly a great goal, and I could watch it over and over and over. Did any of that jive with you, Ali? How the coach affects the way a team thinks about the game, and then obviously he can't play, but how the performance translates from them. I mean, clearly he had motivated them uh, at the beginning of the game and said, "Look, like we need, we just need to focus on us, and we need to have a good team performance in order to, to succeed." And I think that I agree that Tyler Adams had. Um, a great performance today and he was the engine of the team today and I think that's how they were very successful because they felt like he was very really involved with a lot of the play especially in the attack more so than in previous games. Red Bulls winners here 3-0 oh, 3-1 on aggregate what a performance from them as we figure out where we're going here of course Columbus Crew SC is uh, out but Aaron Long is out of goals for this game. We thought he scored it. Everybody did. They were happy about it. But one lone Twitter warrior was out there protecting <laughs> Alice Wheel's reputation. Julie Stewart-Binks caught up with Aaron Long after this game. Aaron, congratulations. What a performance tonight. You guys walk away with the 3-0 win in this second leg. Knowing just how much you needed this, how would you describe what changed in the second half with Royer and the Brace? Yeah, I mean, there was a cool confidence in the group uh, in the locker room up 1-0. Uh, we knew they were a very good team tactically, and to be to be dominating them in the first half felt really good. We knew we had to keep up the, the intensity in the second half, and Royer is just unbelievable. That's how we that's how we finished games with him right there. On the other side of the ball, how would you describe your defensive performance and getting the clean sheet tonight? Yeah, I, I don't think we gave up much. I think we learned from our mistakes very well in the in the first game, uh, them getting a lot of chances and, and being dangerous. I don't think they were too dangerous today, so I think we learned from our mistakes. All right, so you got Atlanta next. You guys were basically neck and neck all season. You've won there in Atlanta before. What are your thoughts on the uh, the matchup? Yeah, I mean, they're a great team. Uh, their, their points in the league show it. 
Uh, they're dominant at home, so it's going to be it's going to be tough going there. But we, we love playing Atlanta, to be honest. We love it. All right, congratulations, Aaron. We're Thank going you so much. Straight to the scythe on him. All right, Doyle, this is your territory here. Yeah. Maker of souls, <laughs> Columbus Crest. See, your time has come. Yeah, it, it came, and it, it came right around the same time that it, it tends to come for Columbus. This point in the playoffs. Uh, last year as well and I think we all saw it coming because of the overall quality difference in terms of guys who could get out there and you know Daniel Royer's putting those chances away Pedro Santos is not um, that said it's just goodbye for now with Columbus it's also see you next year with Columbus which I, I think we're all looking forward to um, but we're gonna see a different Columbus team Probably not going to be Greg Berhalter anymore. Maybe not Pipa Iguain. Maybe Will Trapp will move on as well. There are some questions about it, uh, but I think we're all looking forward to 2019 in Central Ohio. Yep, there are some uh, differences to come for Columbus Crest C supporters out there, but a season that they can absolutely be proud of here. Out in the conference semifinal to the Red Bulls, they set a record for points. No shame there, crew fans. Look ahead to 2019 and perhaps a new head coach. We'll follow that very, very closely with Greg Berhalter over the coming weeks. All right, New York City FC, Atlanta. Atlanta almost got the supporter shield, only they fell just short. We know this is Tata Martino's final season with the Five Stripes. And so they paid homage to him, and then Atlanta United went out. And I'm not going to say ran NYCFC off the field, Allie, but they put in a complete performance here. Absolutely. I mean, these are two of the best forwards in the, in the league, and maybe two of the best that the league has ever seen. And uh, two forwards that every team want to have. And they finish their chances and their opportunities um, and they've helped this team succeed all season and it was clear tonight uh, that they were deserved deserved this win absolutely yeah Maxime Chino, you know the goal that, that kept <laughs> made you think oh hey maybe this will happen Domi Torrent and uh, Tato Martino had some moments on the sideline though but in the end Joseph Martinez is back two well, goals look, look at this finish too did that look like a confident striker to you? Yeah, it looked like a slice. He knew what he was doing there. Yeah, well, you have to come through that and across it to be able to find that near post there. Uh, excellent technique. And when we've seen Joseph Martinez uh, struggle a little bit at the end of the season, it, there was a little bit of a lack of confidence yeah. or a little bit of some hesitation there. Well, I mean, the way he took that one, I mean, showed me a bouncing ball. That's not an easy finish. I understand he's got some space and time around him, but that's where he actually uh, created some problems for himself before. So if you're the Red Bulls, Beware, because this is a, a much uh, more informed team with uh, Martinez and yeah. Almiron Fire. Absolutely. 4 1 winners on aggregate Atlanta United. Our own Jillian Sakovitz, who's covered this team all year, was down at Mercedes Benz Stadium. She caught up with Brad Guzan after this game. Brad, Atlanta United, they make history. First playoff series win. They're heading to the Eastern Conference Championship. Why was it Atlanta that advanced here today? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we set the tone in the first leg uh, at their place last week. That was a huge result. Um, we knew we were going to get some chances tonight. Um, we expected better from them from the first leg. We knew that wasn't their best, and they, they definitely came with it tonight, and we were able to weather some storms at time uh, and ultimately got the result we needed. It was a physical series, more than 35 fouls in this leg alone. How important was it for this group to keep their composure? Yeah, it was huge, uh, especially when some calls didn't go our way. Obviously, the goal, uh, you know, Miguel's goal gets overturned in New York. Um, I was really pleased with how we kept our concentration, uh, how we kept our, our discipline, and ultimately our fighting spirit. Because in big games this year, we've been known not to show, not you know, not to show up. And and uh, you know, all the credit goes to the guys in front of me because over the two legs, we definitely did. All the credit goes to the guys in front of me, says Brad Guzan. And I, I gotta imagine he's thinking one guy in particular. I mean, not to play favorites or anything like that, Doyle, but Miguel and Lerone throughout this game. All of us sitting at this table, Bobby Warshaw hanging out over there, we're all just kind of slack-jawed at some of these moments in the open field. Hey, he's, he's a player unlike any other currently in MLS, and his ability to get on the ball and just run away from defenses and cause so many problems, not just in midfield where he's picking the ball up, but in the back line because now they're making decisions faster than they want to as to do I step or do I drop and what angle is he coming at me at and where's the run going. All of it happens faster with Miguel Amaron on the field, and that's the difference he, between Atlanta right now and Atlanta He's the one player ago. where if you had never watched an MLS game, or shoot, if you'd never even watched a soccer game before and you showed up and you saw Amaron play, you'd be like, who's that guy? Right. <laughs> I mean, they had that one play with Ring where he puts it through his legs and then just meet, meet goes down the other way, uh, almost gets on the end of it, and then when you get a set piece, you, you can't make a foul around this team right. around the box if you try and play too physical because you can do that. Kevin Kratz like. Yeah. A little tricky though, because they moved that ball up, Allie. And I, I know you saw that, but I wonder for a fullback 
what it's like when you watch an attacker like that and think, ooh, what happens if you have to defend him? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you you got to give him some space. Or, you know, if he drifts, it depends on, you know, how many other forwards are uh, in the back line. But he does such a great job getting in the seams. And then, but he also varies, varies uh, his runs. So sometimes he's getting in behind yeah. or cuts in across. And so you have to just have great communication as defenders in the back. Um, kind of get on his backside so that he can't turn and doesn't have that time. So I think it just, very, you know, it depends, uh, you know, because you never know where he's going to be. He's so dynamic and he's just tricky and kind of gets off the back shoulder. He comes in to receive balls and turns. And even in the central midfield, we saw that one highlight mm -hmm. where he gets the ball in central midfield, beats like three of the New York City FC players and goes to goal. And they're in the, the attacking yeah. in the uh, final third. So... It just depends. you got to be careful. And that's a problem for defenders. When it depends, you don't know what you're doing. Julian Sakovitz caught up with Miguel Amarone after this game. Let's take a listen. Miguel, Atlanta United yet again makes history. You guys are heading to the Eastern Conference Championship. What does it mean? No, significa, esta victoria significa mucho para nosotros. Eh, no solamente para nosotros, sino también para el club, para la institución. Creo que, creo que algo histórico. Y nada, disfrutar, disfrutar hoy y ya pensar en, lo, en el partido que se viene. Miguel, gracias. No, Justin? This win means a lot for us, um, but not just for us as players, but also for the club as an institution. I think it's a historic win for the team, um, but, you know, we're going to enjoy this win, and then we're going to get ready for our next game. Justin, thanks so much. Guys? Miguel Miron, evasive in the open field, evasive in interviews. He took off, man. He had something to celebrate. They're going to the conference <laughs> championships. they got two weeks to rest, two weeks to get himself right and ready for that one. Bobby Warshaw, though, saw some things in this game tactically. A little yeah. formation. You guys, we've seen Atlanta win by outpassing teams. We've seen Atlanta win by hitting teams on the counter. In this series, we saw Atlanta United for the first time win by being nails defensively. And let's take a look at it. They came out in both these games in a 5-3-2. And we have a perfect picture of it right here. Back five, here we see LGP stepping up because he's allowed to do that with other center backs helping him. The midfield triangle, Julian Gressel, Darlington Nagby and Eric Ramidi behind them, and Miguel Marone and Joseph Martinez up top. And what that does in a 5-3-2, three center backs, three tight center mids, is it clogs the middle. It makes it really hard to play through you. Think Montreal Impact this year. Think Portland Timbers. But the thing about Atlanta United is that they have multiple superstars up top. They've got guys like Miguel Marone, Jul or Joseph Martinez, Ezekiel Barco off the bench. And what I found interesting in this series is they didn't try and pass through this, right? LGP had options. He could have played Ramidi. He could have played Almarone checking. He could have played maybe uh, Parker's back and switched the field. But he doesn't do that. He decides to say, hey, let's go ahead and play it long. Let's play direct, go straight over them, sit, counter right away. That's what we saw from Atlanta United, guys. We didn't see a team that tried to play pretty football. We didn't see a team that tried to outskill the other team. We saw a team that was nails defensively, stayed compact, and then said, screw it. Let's go over the top. Let's get the ball to our stars in the attacking end, and let's score that way. It's a different Atlanta United team we've seen. What I love about this is they now have a new way to win. They can beat you in pretty much every way possible. And I wonder if this was actually kind of designed a little bit with the Red Bulls in mind, because they've tried to go out and possess against the Red Bulls. They've tried to go out and press the Red Bulls. What they haven't done is sit in a bunker and counter the Red Bulls to death. They did it against NYCFC. Again, one of the better pressing teams in the league, though maybe not under Dolmay yeah. Durant. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of that in the you next round. Give numbers to this, guys. 30% possession in the, in the first game, 30% possession in the second game. They clearly were not trying to have the ball in either of these. They're the Whitecaps. Mm -mm. Except they're in the playoffs. <laughs> and they're not going to, well, I guess they're getting a new coach. So that's not really the same. If you want that Mark Dos Santos inter interview, I've got that as well. Look, another number for you, 3-0-1. That's the Rebels record against Atlanta United. We'll get to the preview for all of these conference championships in just a little bit. But let's talk NYCFC. And before we get out the scythe and put them to rest officially here, <laughs> David Villa, this could be his last game. Ali, when you think about a legend like that, maybe leaving NYCFC, leaving MLS, maybe leaving the professional game for good, we don't know for sure. He skipped the interview process, though, as you can see here from Christian Arios. How does that make you feel? Um, it's a bit sad and uh, because he's such a amazing player he's he is a legend and especially in this league um, he's the captain of the team he's a leader of the team and uh, he's been so great having in the league and just to be able to watch him play here live as well as on TV week in and week out has been really impressive and it'll be sad to see him see him go 
Look at that. The Two, a one World Cup winner to another. Yeah. Really. <laughs> I love Boom. it. <laughs> but I mean, when I think back on, you know, living in the I stand like U that, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the Ali Krieger pose right there. Uh, when, I, when I think about coming and working at MLS and, and living in New York City, the one player that I would spend money to go watch, the first player I would spend the money to go watch, is David Villa up at, up at Yankee Stadium. I mean, his effort from the beginning of the game to the end, and even tonight, you know, I mean, he, he's just an incredible player to and watch. Let's, and let's put it in context, right? We, we talked about maybe Wayne Rooney as MVP of the league this year. Well, David Villa played just about the same minutes as Wayne Rooney and had more goals and nearly as many assists. And they're a clearly much better team with him still on the field. I, I think he has gas left in his tank. I hope he's back in 2019. He's too wonderful. The other difference between Wayne Rooney and David Villa, one of those guys has actually won the Landon out of an MVP award. That <laughs> is David Villa. Still a lot to find out as it pertains to his future. We hope he sticks around just for our sake, but we hope he does what he feels right in his heart. Domi Torrent took over this team halfway through the season from Patrick Vieira. Did not work out for him in the playoffs. Here's what he had to say after the game. Because sometimes you play, you ask me all the time when Joe uh, uh, doesn't play, you ask me about Joe. When Isma doesn't play, you ask me about Isma. <laughs> when uh, doesn't play, Jesus is about Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. Try to analyze a little bit more the, the game, what happened in the game. Anyone else? Good? Thank you. He's not happy. Not happy about that question. It was about Joingo Burgett, who did not get into this game. Perhaps an attacking weapon that could have come in off the bench. Uh, Domi Torrent did not really find the best form for this team over the second half of the season, Doyle. And I, I think that's a little bit of an understatement. Patrick Vieira had him in the big three. They just had injuries, a lack of form, and now they're out. Four, eight, and four across all competitions in the final 16 games of the season. I think a negative eight goal differential in that time period. Uh, they didn't. They didn't look like they knew what they were doing over the, the last couple of months of the season, and you could see it with the way they came into games, like really unsure. Jan Hal Herrera in particular struggled today just to know where his next option was, and that's a sign of a team that's not really well-drilled or understanding of, of what the tactical identity is. Now, they still had enough uh, talent on the field to come back and give teams hell other than Atlanta United, but you see, when you play a team like Atlanta United, play a team that good, um, it takes more than talent takes a game plan, and uh, that's why we bring out the scythe, Andrew. The, the, <laughs> the, fourth, the fourth iteration of NYCFC <laughs> is done, and I think it's maybe the most frustrating one. Like, everybody understood in 2015 it was an expansion team, 2016 just getting their feet under their ground, and last year, I know, didn't end the way that they wanted to, but th there's a, a sense of finality and frustration here because they were – so much worse at the end of the season than they were at the start of the season. The lineups, the formations, the approaches changed every single game under Dome Torrent. They, I mean, they need to get an identity back this offseason, and it probably comes down to Torrent figuring out what he wants to do um, and then sticking to it. Because, again, this team did not look like they knew any of that since about the middle of July onwards. Claudio Reyna says he has faith in his head coach. Said he, look, he came in midseason, new team, new country, new league. He'll figure it out. The underlying statistics actually weren't that bad under Dome Turin. Now, uh, the number don't, one. No, don't buy that. Uh, because, no, because that's all game state dependent. Don't give go. me don't give me ex expected goals when you're trailing 90% of the time, which is what happened. Like, again, this team has enough talent to go out there and generate pretty decent chances. But if you're going into the game at a disadvantage, you're going to give up early goals, which is what defined them over the last quarter of the season, half of the season, really, and into the playoffs. Tommy Trent's team now, it seems, got to figure it out. I feel angry. I, I yelled I know, at you, I you man. I I'm angry you at Domi, not at you. Set it up, spike it. Here we go. On to the Western Conference. RSL upset special in the knockout round. You see it there. They took down LAFC at LAFC, and then they got drawn with Sporting Kansas City, and it started well, and then Rushnak scored, and then Rushnak got suspended, and then this little guy popped up <laughs> with a beautiful beard. Wow. Johnny Russell impersonator himself. And then this game was all sporting Kansas City. Nick Beasler comes in the starting lineup. He's from KC. He's Matt's brother. He had some tough moments that Bobby Warshaw will go over in just a little bit. But Diego Rubio pays off in the starting lineup. Kalen for Peter Vermees. And then they just got rolling. And then it got a little weird for them because they couldn't hold on to a lead. Yeah, well, you got to give uh, Salt Lake a lot of credit for fighting their way back because I, I thought this one was 
completely over uh, at one point. And uh, they made some nice changes. Petke brought in Saucedo here, who, who's going to score the goal shortly, and, and really pushed the game a little bit late. To, they had some genuine looks at goal to be able to do it until uh, Daniel Shallowy put it away late. We're not going to say right now what we think about that PK. A lot of people in Sandy were not happy with that one. And the chip, the panenka from Hillier. Yes, that is nasty, son. This is not very good marking. No, it's not. It was, the RSL would not die. And they, they have a lot of talented players. And Shoot it! Just shoot it! No! Oh. I, I, like, I, I, I felt a little bit bad like for Nick Beasler. I mean, he's a, he's a USL midfielder who um, was thrust into the center of defense in, in the playoffs, and uh, Kansas City punished him for just about the full 90 minutes. Oh, this is why I love Shallowy, though. A little like no that? look right there, a little personality. You like that? Of oh, I love he it. Likes it. Love that. If Bobby liked it too, he would not have liked it had it come against him. <laughs> he might have thrown the red tackle after that one. Sporting Kansas City's last couple playoff runs, well, we knew how that worked. The knockout round was mm -mm -mm, not kind of them. We don't even have 2014 in there, which was another L in the knockout round. They tossed the L up on RSL afterwards on social media. Slam dunk. It was uh, pretty nice. This was a weird game, though, Ali, and uh, it was a game in which, as Kaylin said, we thought Sporting Kansas City had just put it away. Right. And then all of a sudden, boom, that's a no-look toss to you. What happened? <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> it's really... It's all about game management. I think when you go up to nothing, you need to get that third goal. You need to keep trying to score and, and in order to put the game away. And I think they allowed uh, Salt Lake to get back into the game too quickly. And I know two nothing is a tough lead to keep, but you have to, you know, in other words, like break the team's neck and, and put that third goal in mm -hmm. and finish off the game uh, because they did come out so confident. And and I think that you know it's just unfortunate that they allowed them to come back, but obviously. Obviously, in the end, it ended up working out. Yeah, in the end. I'm sure that film session with Peter Ramis is going to be interesting this coming week. Guys, what happened? Susanna Collins was at Children's Mercy Park. She found out what happened from Daniel Shalwe. All right, Daniel. They didn't make it easy for you. You guys went out to that early lead. They fought their way back in this one. But how were you able to finally put them away and keep them at bay? Yes, I'm super happy that we could win the game. It's very difficult when you go up... Uh, 2-0 and you know you kind of get comfortable you know you have to go but it's difficult they were they're a good team they came uh, with all their energies and uh, I'm glad we could score another one at the end and I'm just happy that we advanced and I'm ready for the conference final it's the first playoff win here in five years for this team what does it mean to these fans what does it mean to you guys it means a lot we were talking about it the it's crazy to think that the last time they were here was winning the MLS Cup and uh, now we are back and I think they deserve the win after that one because it took us too long to get back here but we want to win again against Portland and then uh, if we have to travel we have to be home for the cup final but first of all Portland. One step closer to the ultimate goal. How do you like this matchup against Portland in the Western Conference Finals? I like it. I like Portland. Uh, their stadium, their environment, I think it's, it's going to be a great game. And uh, I was watching their game against Seattle. That was crazy. And uh, I expect the same against us. Hopefully we come up. Daniel, thank you so much. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It's rare, uh, Weeby, sometimes when you see players with Daniel Shallowy's skill set, uh, kind of like rangy guys that are able to get in behind. He's so good in the box, in those tight spaces. You know, There's a, a little bit of a phone box situation where he's able to just get that first touch and the second one, just enough to get it on frame. We saw him do it on decision day earlier. I think this is his 13th goal in the season now and has been able to step up in big moments. And to Bobby's point, I know Bobby wanted to you know, maybe throw a little tackle in there late on, on the no look, but, <laughs> but, but you don't score 13 goals without a little bit of personality and that's yeah. the thing I like about him he's got a little bit of personality a little bit of flair and look even if he's not having a good game we saw him in the first leg pressure Ramondo he's the one who created that turnover there and that's exactly the same type of situation where he was able to get the icing one that put this series through and put them through to the conference championship yeah speaking of personality uh, Mike Pecky has a good bit of personality and sometimes he makes some decisions, Doyle, that we are a little bit confused by. And I think there were some in this game. We talked about him in the pregame. The lineup comes out, and you have Nick Beasler at center back, and you're thinking, well, 
Justin Glad, what happened there? Of course, okay. Silva was hurt, so he had to make a decision. And Silva up top, and Mulholland in the midfield, and some of those didn't work out. I, I mean, the, the, the Silva decision with, with Baird going out with the concussion made total sense. Mulholland coming back in, given how well he played against LAFC, made total sense. The Beasler one left me, it left everybody scratching their head because, again, he's a guy who has played most of his career, both college and in the pros, as a central midfielder. And when he had a good run of games at center back, it was three or four at center back earlier this year, it was with Justin Glad. Justin Glad had played like, it started 50 straight games and then got yanked late in the season for no real discernible reason and was the obvious choice to come in here with Marcelo Silva uh, injured for this game. And I think everybody was shocked. I think everybody was shocked that it was Beasler getting the start at center back instead of Justin Glad. I, I, I don't know how Justin Glad got in Mike Pecky's doghouse exactly, but it, it, it is bizarre, and I think it cost him. I think it cost the team. Pecky, after this game, said that he started Beasler because he played really, really well at Children's Mercy Park in a 1-1 draw earlier this year. Unfortunately for Nick, it was not a game that he'll be looking back on fondly. Bobby, the tape. Yeah, the tape. you took a look at the tape. Walk yeah. us through this. Yeah, let's break it down, guys. Let's go through the first two goals that SKC scored today, and we're just going to run them through and see if we see a pattern here. Here's Johnny Russell turning Jao Plata, playing a ball down the middle. Felipe Gutierrez gets on the end of it and Diego Rubio finishes it. Here's the second one. A different angle, the second goal. I want you to see both coming right down the middle, right through the heart of the RSL defense, right through the center backs. Now, I want to stop this first goal. We only have time to dissect one, so I want to dissect this first one. And we're going to do a buffet style, all right? I'll go first. I want you to look at Nick Beasler's positioning right here. Matt Doyle, you're next. Pick out of the buffet. Who do you want them to watch on RSL? Oniwaha, the other center. Back. Okay, right here, the second X. Ali Krieger, World Cup winning outside back. Who do you want us to watch right now? The right back. The right back, back who's not right. even in the screen right now. He's somewhere over here. All right. So that's the three people to watch out for: Nick Beasler, Oniwaha, and Brooks Lennon out of the screen. The ball goes right down the middle. What I want to point out on my end: Nick Beasler, too tight to his other center back. When there is a player to your right, you've got to check your shoulder and know that you need to slide to the right over to that player and leave the center striker in your center back partner zone. Matt Doyle, what do you want them to look at here? I, I just want to see o Anuaha. He's the veteran out there. He's the Premier League veteran with 200 odd professional games. When you're playing on a back line with kids, the veteran is there to make up for the mistakes, to clean up the mess. He does not do that. He switches off right here. Okay, and Ali Krieger. He just needs to stay attached to the right center back. Yep, to that's Brooks Lennon. And I think he just needs to tuck in a little bit. You never want to be more than 15 yards away from your center back. That's right. I agree. Three mistakes. I was going to come up here and just talk about Nick Beasler being too close to a center back partner, leaving too big of a gap that Felipe Gutierrez can run through. And if you watch any tape of SKC this year, you have to know that Felipe Gutierrez is going to run from the center midfield position yeah. through the center backs. But it was three Cascadian mistakes from So Mike Petke could took a chance. I appreciate Mike Mike Petke taking chances, guys, but it didn't work today. His defense didn't look good. Too many mistakes, too many goals again. The striker up here is thinking, well, you could drive a Mack truck through that hole, and I'm pretty sure I could find it and score a goal. <laughs> you we think a lot about Mack trucks? Yeah. yeah. I can't believe he squared that. He was in on goal. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Striker's thinking, whoa, 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 Felipe. You should be shooting that thing. Here's what Mike Petke had to say after this game. I mean, trying to think of a, a time that I had more pride to be honest with you, after that second half. You know, that, that was obvious. I was blown away by their reaction against a team that's a very good team at home, to go down 2-0, um, to be without two key players, um, and to see us take it to them in the second half and have two clear-cut chances to, to, to tie the game and, and take the series. Um, but it's a game of inches. But I mean, for now, all I could say is um, extremely proud. I think that any RSL supporter out there watching tonight should realize how how much these guys put in, and, and, and they should be proud. Just you mentioned the future. Just. The experiences that a lot of these young guys got this postseason, how it's going to help this club moving forward, big picture. Well, that's on. That's up to them, to be honest with you. You know, uh, that was the plan this year. That was why I played the most homegrown young players in the league. It is not for uh, 
you always want to win this year. I want to win every game, you know, and I want to win everything I do. But it's also something in the back of your mind about playing young kids like this. Okay, well, this is going to pay dividends next week, next month, next season, you know. But it comes down to them realizing, um, you know, the, some of the mistakes that have been made this year um, and correcting them. And that's a part of being a professional. It's part of, um, of, of elevating your game. You know, if not, you're just going to stay the same player. So I'm glad we got this experience with these young guys. I think they came through big for us at certain times. At certain times, it was a learning experience. Thoughts on the penalty kick call there? Uh, I haven't, I haven't watched it. You know, the only thing that I said to um, the fourth official, which I stand by, is that the ball was in Nick's hands. You know, so was it truly? I, I, I told him, be certain, please, be certain that this is 100 percent because this is not the type of game that you just go with. Yeah, I called it. We're going to go with it. You know, I think that he did well. Was it Rubio drew it? Yes. Rubio drew it. It was he did well with his body, and when I thought Natum was going after the ball. Um, but to me, in a game like this, I'll have to rewatch it because you know, I know things happen fast. There is VAR, but I, I was concerned. I was curious as to the ball went right to Nicky. You know, he had no chance of getting that after that touch. So, I don't know. How did not having Corey... Well, there's Howard Webb down there, I think. Uh, <laughs> you guys could ask him. <laughs> How did not having Corey and Marcelo... All right, talking about VAR there. Well, it wasn't a clear and obvious error, so it could have been overturned. Had they not called it, yeah, maybe you could have come back and done that. Th this looked like a penalty to me, to be honest with you. Well, this didn't. But the, the uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the one that was called, I think it was pretty obviously a... A penalty like it's not a great touch from Rubio uh, but you see right here he gets cleared out that's a foul anywhere it happens on the field and that's why we showed the previous clip if it happens in midfield it's a yellow card if it happens in the box it's a penalty what says the defender I just think you got to know where you are on the field and if you're in the box you got to be careful obviously he maybe wasn't in the best position that's why he uh, overcompensated and I think yeah, it I didn't like the call. I, th I thought he was. I thought Rubio was searching for it. Uh, but once you make the call, I don't think there was a clear and obvious error yeah. made on the right. judgment of the referee. All right, RSL are out. That means it's scythe time. Their soul joins eight other souls in these playoffs. It's been harvested. Uh, I, I think RSL did really well with house money getting into the the, the playoffs uh, by the grace of the Houston Dynamo, and that did really well against LAFC and did really well in the first leg and this just was a bridge too far but this offseason now was about figuring out who that car is. I remain shocked that Justin Glad uh, was not a part of this. I remain shocked at what happened with Danny Acosta uh, and Nick Romando and Kyle Beckerman are not getting any younger. They have to add some big pieces and they have to rediscover who they are and build with those kids. If the Red Bulls can do it and win one supporter shield and maybe be on their way to an MLS Cup, RSL should try to do the same. All right, let's take a look at the final four as it stands now. RSL out. Sporting Kansas City, Timbers, Red Bulls, Atlanta remain in the Audi 2018 MLS Cup playoffs. MLS Cup is on December 8th, 1125, November 25th and November 29th. Those are the two dates for the conference championship games. And we need to know some X factors here, Bobby Warshaw. So take us through what you think the players in these series will be. Yeah, and we're going to look at the second layer. We know who the main X factors are, Diego Valeri, Miguel Marone, but I want to go below that. The guys who's, who a good performance can really win a game and a bad performance can really, really bring their teams down. And let's go ahead and take a look first. Jeremy Ibo BC. Ebobacy, Ebobacy. Ebobacy. I overthought it. I overthought <laughs> it. The Portland Timbers, and I believe that soccer is a weak link game, that your worst player, if he has a bad game, can hurt your team. And Ebobacy is a good player, but he's still Portland's weakest attacker.